morning and welcome back to Taylor Time Live. I'm your host, Seth Gladden, and today we're going to be talking about adhesives. Over the next hour, we're going to be looking at four key areas that are going to help save you time and money and also help you stick with the facts. So what are those four key areas? First, we'll look at terminology, then we're gonna talk about site conditions, then installation tools, and finally, how to select the right product. Remember, at the end of this, we will be answering your questions, so please text those to the number at the bottom of the screen. Today, I'm joined by three industry experts who are gonna share their knowledge with you, and also be, uh, be sure to, to submit your questions so that they can answer those. So joining me this morning in studio is Gary Scheidker, Director of Tech Services for Taylor Adhesives. Gary, thank you for being here. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Gary comes with a lot of experience in the field, over 50 years, I believe. Yeah, I am very experience. old. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't calling you old. Yeah. Over 50 years of experience, though. Um, so he's got a lot of knowledge, and, and obviously at Taylor, that's what we do as adhesives. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this is a good one today. Um, joining us remotely is Robert Varden, Executive Director of CFI. Robert, thanks for being here. Absolutely happy to be here as always, Seth. Thank you. For sure. And Robert, would you mind just quickly sharing um, maybe a little bit about CFI and then also kind of how you guys have been handling trainings and, and different things through, uh, through this pandemic? Thank you, Seth. I'd love to really. You know, CFI, you know, to put it in, in the shortest version possible, for 26 years, our goal really has been, you know, and, and it's really twofold now, you know, 20 plus years, it was to basically reach out to the existing body, educate them, train them a little bit better. And the bottom line was so that they could go out and make, you know, a better living for their families. The reason why I say back 20 years ago, now from the last five to six years, we had to add recruiting to that piece. So now basically our goal is to recruit, to train, educate, and then certify individuals. And again, let them know of all the opportunities that exist in this industry for them to go out and make a better living. Uh, I will say, which is, was pretty exciting, obviously, you know, that COVID kind of shut everybody down there for a while. And if you do training, meaning you have to get groups together <clears throat> to do hands-on training, right. those two, you know, got canceled a lot. Uh, we, however, we did our first real, you know, it was a one week intro to hardwood laminate LVT training here at the school a week before last. Okay. And we actually had to turn students away. You know, oh, wow. we maxed class at 14 to still stay within all of the CDC guidelines and disinfecting and I mean, all of those things. But uh, yeah, we had students calling still trying to get in the class even after it was full. So well, we were very time. excited to see that, to see that yeah. they're, they're still eager to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Robert, thank you for sharing that um, and definitely appreciate the work you do. And, uh, and I think you probably know a little bit about adhesives, so glad to have you here. Also joining us today is John McGrath with Install. John, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's, you know, it's an honor. You know, we have um, some experts here. Um, I call everybody brothers and sisters, so don't be unnerved <laughs> when I refer to you as brother Seth or brother Robert or brother Gary. Hey, that's um, okay. Uh, thank you. And so uh, it's nice to be here with some experts, and I'll try to contribute as much as I can to give you some value. Um, I'm the director of INSTALL. INSTALL is the International Standards and Training Alliance. The name kind of describes our focus. Uh, INSTALL is a collaboration or it's an alliance among manufacturers, employers, and installers. And together we work together to try to address the, the, any challenges that are in the industry. Training yeah. is our foundation. And so through uh, apprenticeship program, career long training, we work together and basically this conversation today is going to deal a lot with training and because uh, training basically solves a lot of the problems in the industry. It so sure uh, does, yeah. brother Robert and I are, are, are shoulder to shoulder and trying to help p installers in the industry, trying to make a better living by, by learning their craft, learning their profession. And so we're happy to help out in any way we can. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John. We really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us here today, and we're and we're looking forward to the the uh, next few minutes that we've got to spend together. So, um, that being said, let's go ahead and start talking about terminology. Uh, that's that's definitely something in the industry. Some of it seems basic, right? But terminology can be very important, and and um, how we communicate that. So, I guess uh, I'm just gonna kind of open this up to the panel here. Um, what are some of the common terms that you guys see in the adhesive world 
and and how do you attribute those and what what should uh, installers be on the lookout for with with the terminology Robert you want to start you want me to well Gary why don't you start with some because I've got some questions on some of those I think you're gonna say <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, basically, when we start talking about adhesives, when you get into fundamentals, we are looking at either maybe dry set, wet set, or a semi-wet installation. So the installer has to realize what the product is designed to do, what the adhesive is designed to do, and also what the flooring type requires. You, know, you get into certain flooring types, you may want to use it as a dry set or as a wet set. And what we'll typically find is if you've got a modular product, LVT, LVP, rubber, something like that, that is not dimensionally stable, the flooring manufacturer may call for a wet set installation. That means you go into the adhesive while you're still getting wet transfer. Some other products may require going into it as a dry set, as a PSA. So when you go into it as a dry set, what you're normally gonna do is you'll apply your adhesive, you'll let it dry, where it dries to the touch, put your hand in it, you don't get transferred to the back of your hand or the palm of your hand, and then you can do the installation as a dry set. It's an easier installation for the installer. You don't get the slippage, you don't get movement and things like that. And then you go into kind of a, an in-between spot, and you have to really hit a sweet spot when it comes to semi-wet. You allow the adhesive to dry between the notches, so it starts to skin over there, but you're still going to get some wet transfer on the trowel ridges. And when we're talking about trowel ridges, you can talk about different dimensions of trowels and things like that. When an adhesive manufacturer or a flooring manufacturer gives you a trowel dimension to use for their products, it is absolutely critical that you follow those instructions. Uh, getting something close or a worn down trawl can be a problem. And what will happen, this is a square notch trawl, it's a 1 16th by 1 16th by 1 16th square notch, very common for resilient type of flooring. But they'll start to wear and it depends upon the installer, the way you press it, the way you work the trawl, and every, every installer is going to be a little bit different where it's going to start to fatigue and wear a little bit faster. So, but those areas will wear. So yes. Gary, I'm going to jump in on you here. You're, um, <coughs> excuse me. You're, I talk a little you're, fast. You're, no, you're getting ahead of us actually. That's going to be an install tools. Okay. Um, so, so back to the terminology though, you were talking about um, difference between wet set, dry set, things like yes. that. Obviously there's, there's other terms associated with that dry time. Um, or, or flash time, uh, open time, cure time, all of these sort of different, um, you know, heavy, heavy traffic, right? Light traffic, heavy rolling loads, all these different terms that we use. Um, Robert, you said you had some questions on that. So do you want to go ahead and, and let us know what those are? Well, you guys had had some, some, you know, acronyms that related to very technical stuff. And I was going to see if Gary was going to throw those out because those were certainly something that I wanted to address and make sure the audience knew more of what he was referring to. You know, yeah. I think, you know, when you come into dry time, flash time, open time, really that's almost kind of where the installer came from and maybe what particular product he's using. You know, open time, and I know we're going to get into this and in maybe in some other category because to me, that is a that's that's one of the large issues I see as far as failure issues. Um, so that's not falling under the terminology, but just so kind of everybody's clear, you know, dry time, flash time, open time, uh, depending on the product, may may end up being all the same thing. Sure. So so what should you look for, I guess, when when you see flash time on an adhesive, how how does that translate in the field? So if you've got a PSA and, you, and we say it needs to flash, flash off, um, how would you describe that, Gary? Well, you know, usually, <laughs> depending on the product, and again, we're, we're talking, you know, a multitude of different manufacturers here, usually it has to do with the color. Uh, you know, some of your PCAs will turn to a translucent, most of them. Um, sometimes, too, it'll just be the tack, depending on, you know, say a carpet adhesive, getting away from the PSAs. You know, we use terminologies like, where you guys get a little technical, we get a little more simple. You know, when we first spread an adhesive, you know, we might say that has kind of a, a mayonnaise feel to it. You know, if you put your finger in it, it's real, real, real thin, real runny. We want that to, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily change colors like a PCA. It might get a little bit of a different tint to it. But then we talk about, you know, it might turn from a mayonnaise feel to a peanut butter feel. Um, and again, you can touch it with your finger, see if it's starting to get tacked, see if it's starting to develop legs. Those are some of the terminologies we'll actually use in the field, knowing that when it's time to put that product into it. Gotcha. Okay. So when, when a manufacturer maybe says um, flash time, you're, you're talking mayonnaise to peanut butter. 
Is that is that what you're saying? In some cases, correct. Did yes. you miss breakfast? Is that <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound good? Is that why we're talking about food? Yeah. <laughs> um, so so some of that in field stuff is very good for you know for us to know as well um, as a manufacturer, but. What would you say, I guess, you, you mentioned some of the more maybe um, uh, in-depth terms. Are you talking about like cross-linking or um, wh what, what type of terms are maybe like moisture tolerant versus moisture barrier? What type of terms were you talking about, Robert? Well, it was when you were talking cross-linking and you had some abbreviations as far as, you know, different, different chemical compositions and how they relate to the adhesive and how it performs. So I was gonna. I wanted to clarify if, if Gary brought those up. I wanted to make sure we clarified those. Okay. Um, like, go ahead, Gary. Do you need me to cover that or? Yeah, let's talk okay. about cross linking. Uh, well, one of the things we talk about is MVER, moisture vapor emissions rate, which I'm assuming is one of the things you were talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be measured with the calcium chloride test, <clears throat> and the calcium chloride test is the ASTM F1869. It's the old dome test. It's been around for many years. It tells you how much moisture is coming out of the slab in a 24-hour period per thousand square foot. So to put it in context, if you have eight pounds of moisture vapor emissions, you're at one gallon of water coming out of every thousand square foot every 24 hours, which is a significant amount of moisture coming out of the slab. We also will put RH, which would be relative humidity, and now that's an in suet measurement that's measured inside the slab, 40% into the depth of the slab. And then we'll have pH, which is just going to tell you the alkalinity of the slab. And that will be either low to the, to the acid side or high to the alkali side. So, and then you've got other components to go into. We talk about cross-linking with our adhesives. And our cross-linking is a little bit unique. Uh, the adhesives that we have, we actually have some proprietary technology that was patented. But when they cross-link, the products develop strength. And as it develops strength, it gives you that dry set installation very easy to install and then as it cross links it develops more strength so it goes to more of a hard set like it would have been if it would have been a wet set or a semi-wet installation. That help answer some of those Robert? Some of those I was really looking more for the adhesive chemical aspect but you know the moisture we covered of course in that great segment we did on moisture okay. but also you know it, you do bring up a good point as far as you know wet set you know, some guys, you know, let's say you take some of your carpet guys, you know, they're pretty much used to your typical multi-purpose is what we would call it adhesive. I know we're going to get into those a little bit more. You know, I think it's important to, for guys to truly know what a wet set is. You know, sometimes they'll open up that bucket, they'll start spreading it. It was a, an adhesive that was supplied with the material perhaps because it needed to be a wet set. And they don't understand that actually then letting that sit up more than they should is actually going to take away their, you know, aggressiveness rather than add to it. Um, so yeah, you might define a little bit more the wet sets, dry sets, and then of course your multi-purpose type stuff. I think you covered the, the pressure sensitives, which is good, and I think we hit those good. Um, you, you know, maybe on the wet set side, explain a little bit more on how okay. that works versus say your, your typical multi-purpose type adhesive. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> It really depends upon a lot of times what you're installing. If you're installing a, a backing that is not breathable, for instance, like a Shaw EcoWorks Broadloom or a product like that, the HPBL backs, those type of things, those type of backings are designed to prevent moisture from evaporating. So you have to give that adhesive more open or flash time before you drop your floor covering into it. And some of the install installation instructions actually require transfer where you drop the floor covering into it, you pull it back out, and then you let it to start to flash a little bit more and what it does is it just prevents that off gassing and the off gassing bubbles that'll go along with it uh, when you do double stick or like a unitary any kind of uh, high stress type of installation you want to allow that adhesive to start to firm up and uh, going to that peanut butter aspect as far as you know the the difference the texture of the adhesive so as it starts to firm up you'll get less absorption into the back if you drop it in and as robert you know we've we've discussed in previous you know conversations you know you'll do double sticks guys will drop their carpet into it too early they start to traffic it and what ends up happening is they're basically just forcing that wet adhesive up into the backing and they end up losing bond. And it's really not because there's a defect in the cushion or the adhesive or the, the floor covering itself, the carpet. It's that they just trafficked it a little bit too early and dropped it in a little too early. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I know if you look, and, and John, I'm gonna throw a question your way in a second, but if you, if you look 
specifically at um, adhesive marketing in general. I, I can refer to ours, but I think most adhesive manufacturers reference the same, uh, kind of the same data points, right? So we talk about, like we've just mentioned, RH, PH, MVR, that's kind of, you know, in the moisture category, so to speak. I mean, we do have a great segment on that. The billion dollar question uh, was a live event two months ago. Um, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, from there, we also move into you know open time or flash time, uh, cure time, working time, all these. And then we've got light traffic, heavy traffic, heavy rolling loads, IIC, STC, you know, all these different things. John, um, in your experience, what would you say are some of the, the terms maybe that you find uh, most misunderstood? Well, I think it going along with the conversation that it's already been happening, uh, things are relative to the job site conditions. And so open time, uh, okay, well, if uh, depending on the ambient uh, atmosphere, that's going to have an effect on open time. And then at, at basically also the type of installation. So I think that the installers and all the contractors that bid the job need to be very cognizant that their job site conditions and basically doing a bond test prior to it just to see how this is going to work for your installation. Um, so going to your question is, I think that everything has an asterisk to it based on job site conditions. So sure. well, time is going to be different on one job site as opposed to the other. And absolutely. then, yeah, you, you might start to drop the material in and in the initial part of, the, of dropping it in, everything works out perfectly, but you just didn't get to that third sheet to um, to get that in, and so things change. So you have to be very sensitive to the job site conditions and to how it's going to affect your adhesive, and and you have to fit within the time frame. Yeah, for sure. And and John, you said it perfectly. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's the absolute segue into our next segment, which is on-site conditions, right? Um, so, so exactly the point that you were making, so many of these, uh, of this terminology, of these data points, of these things that, that we as adhesive manufacturers say, right, in practicality are not ever as easy as what they may seem. Because if you read the fine print, right, we've got, we, we've, we've set limits for, um, you know, temperature, we've set limits for humidity because we have, to, we have to give numbers, so we have to hold a range that we have those numbers in, right? So when we look at site conditions, uh, let's keep talking about that. Let's let's keep diving into that. So some of the things that we look at there, like we've talked about, obviously moisture is a huge factor. Um, and we have that segment, the billion dollar question on that substrate prep. Uh, we actually covered an uh, episode on that last time, um, prep for success. So you can check those out for more reference. But you know, a lot of these site conditions, acclimation, other trades, so, um, so when it comes to site conditions, Robert, what are some of the biggest ones that you see as being challenges and what should we, we be aware of? Well, obviously, you know, John to mention them as well. You know, you got trades, you got, you know, situation. For instance, you know, Gary, what's your, I know you guys, you know, as with most manufacturers, you know, they pride sometimes the open time, let's say for a VCT type adhesive or for a pressure sensitive, you know, what's your open time for most of those? It, it depends on the product. We've got products that are as little as three hours and others that are as long as 24 hours. It depends upon the chemistry and if the product cross-links. Uh, but right. obviously temperature, so, humidity, and airflow can be a big variable there. So I've got 24 hours I can have open time, but the problem with that is if I leave half of it un, you know, uncovered, I come back in the next day related to the job site conditions and I got people walking on it. I've got people that just sanded the sheetrock dust. I've got, you know, people that hunt ceiling tile over the top of it. So yeah, the soft conditions and those things literally tie right into one another. Yeah. I will say just quickly too, jumping off that, you know, open time, we can never express open time to installers enough, no matter how many times we stress it. I'm sure John as well and all the education and all the training and all the manufacturers, whether they're on the product side or the adhesive side about open time. Because what happens, these guys are basically working under a time slot. They're paid so much per square foot or even by the hour. So what happens is quick as they're literally pulling up the, you know, the balance of the adhesive and putting it in the bucket, they're going straight to the sheet and they're dropping it in. 
So what's happening is open time don't exist in many, many cases. Hmm. And I tell you, some of the issues that I've seen from that, for instance, double glue. You know, if you're putting a woven product into a double glue application, a lot of guys don't understand or they just don't know yet that I don't know of a single manufacturer that doesn't require a seaming tape now for a double glue application. So what happens, you've got a lot of guys that are still just basically just spreading it, putting a bead of seam sealer and calling it good. What happens is they take this woven product, this woven product still has jute in the backing of it. They spread the glue, they weigh in, lay into it while it's still too wet. They don't use a tape. Suddenly they wonder why the next day they come back and their seams are gapped open eighth in the niche. That moisture goes into that jute and it will shrink the material. Like I said, we can never express open time enough, I tell you. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, John, what's, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Do you, do you see any specific site conditions that you think are, are uh, more misunderstood or should be focused on more than others? How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> we, we have um, about another five minutes on this topic. So. <laughs> you know, whether you're dealing with the porosity of the substrate, whether you're dealing about the temperature, whether you're dealing about, um, uh, okay, it's semi-wet installation, or um, and what does semi-wet mean? And, uh, and so there, there's the stakes can get pretty high, and sometimes the standards change. I was talking to some of our instructors prior to this call, and I was asking for examples. And so the one instructor gave me an example where they were installing a, a sheet installation, the vinyl sheet installation. It was supposed to be uh, semi-wet, and no, in fact, it was supposed to be a dry installation. And so they checked for porosity, and at that time, they, they measured for porosity. It, it, they, they dropped water, it didn't go in within a minute, and at that time, they said, okay, it's a non-porous substrate. Well, to, uh, shortly after that, it changes its four minutes for the porosity. And so, but so they're playing with it as it's a non-porous substrate. They, 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 they spread the adhesive, the adhesive was spread with the trowel, it was dry to the touch, and then after they dropped the sheet vinyl, the hospital where it was done upgraded the wax and so now the wax showed every single uh, hmm. ridge from all the trout. And so that's, things change all the time. And so I don't know, like for, with this situation, would it have shown if they had stuck with the wax that was in the specification? We don't know that, but the hospital of their own volition improved the wax to make it a shinier finish. 5,000 square, um, square large, 5,000 square yards of sheet vinyl has to be ripped up and replaced. Wow. So there, is, there's, like I said, a bond test earlier, and I think that as much as our people can do it, and I'm not sure that people can always do that, but if you can get onto the job site, do the installation prior to it so you can check the bonding and then check it with the customer, I think that's the safest way for the installation to, for you to know that the installation is going to work. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely correct. Yeah, and we talked about that um, in our in our substrate prep where we did have an hour on this topic. So, <laughs> so uh, that's a great reminder, though, and that's that's definitely a huge thing. Um, any anything else? Let's talk quickly about acclimation. Gary, do you mind talking about the importance of acclimation on site? I'll be happy to. Yeah, acclimation is actually absolutely critical with most resilient flooring types. Uh, broadloom carpet is not as critical, but it can be an issue. You get into high humidity situations, low humidity situations, it can be a real problem. But when we're talking about resilient flooring, LBT, LVP, VCT, homogeneous sheet vinyl, heterogeneous sheet vinyl, wood products, laminate, you know, any of these type of products, they're very temperature and humidity sensitive. So when you acclimate the, the floor covering to the building, it needs to be at the service temperature of the building. So if the building's going to be maintained at 72 degrees at about 50% relative humidity, that's what you want to acclimate the floor covering to. You also want to acclimate it in the areas that it's going to be installed. You don't want to you know, acclimate it in a room over here when you're installing it in a room over here because you're going to get varying temperature and humidity throughout that building. So consequently, when you do that, you make certain that that product is going to be stable. Now, let's say you do an installation. I've, I've ran into it quite a few times where there may be 40 degrees in the building. 
the installers push, he's got to get the job in, and he do, goes ahead and installs the job that looks beautiful until they turn the heat on or they turn the air conditioning on in the summer and then the floor starts to change dimension. Once it starts to change dimension, it starts to curl and move. And that's a real issue. Um, general contractors don't want to have the HVAC on if it's new construction because they're going to be paying for the, the electricity and the utilities that are utilized to you know, provide that. And so they always push back, they don't want to do it. But unfortunately, what can happen is those floors can fail. It's the most critical when you get into laminate and wood because those products are extremely reactive. So how long should we be acclimating? Um, <clears throat> and I know, I, I know we say before, during, and after, right? So, but, but what does that look like and why is that so important to acclimate for that length of time? That rule of thumb is about 72 hours, but um, there was a bamboo product that I saw that was actually written to basically turn down any claim because it required 28 days of acclimation. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, when, when that happens, they, they, they also got to do so. Well, did you acclimate it for 28 days? No, I only got it a week before the installation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you couldn't have acclimated it for 28 days. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times they're written kind of, kind of crazy, but what you're trying to do for wood is you're trying to acclimate it both to temperature and humidity. Anything that's got an organic base where even you know traditional laminates but when you get into vinyl plank and things like that you're really going to be acclimating it for temperature and you want to get it in there I would say at least 48 hours early uh, 72 is preferable if you can and uh, don't acclimate it in the garage if you're installing in the home you know yeah. you, you want to have it acclimated in the, the space and, it's going to be installed in and don't just acclimate your floor covering material right you, yeah. you also want to acclimate the adhesive it's, it. it's a good idea to acclimate the adhesive also because that way everything is at a uniform temperature. You know the products are going to perform. Uh, but acclimation is most important for, for the floor covering itself. So I've, I've heard some over, over um, I, I've been in the industry I guess about five years. So uh, I think you guys have me beat by a few years in that. But I've heard some tips and tricks and I'd love if you guys could share some of those on how to acclimate uh, more efficiently and quicker with both flooring products and adhesives. So things like, should we leave it all stacked on a pallet? Or are there certain things that installers can do that will help them acclimate quicker? Yeah, that's a really good question. When you acclimate, basically, especially if it's going to be modular product like plank, you stack them like Lincoln Logs so that there's airflow. Usually what I try to do is I try to leave a box spacing between the, the boxes. So you'll, you'll space your boxes out one direction. You'll lay them the opposite direction, again, with airspace. So it allows airflow around those, those boxes, and that way it acclimates a little bit faster. You, spack, you stack it in tight. The center of that, that pallet's still going to be hot or cold, whatever it was when it was brought in. You're not going to be able to acclimate it as quickly, and it will probably won't acclimate in the time frame you're looking at too. Yeah. Looking forward to. Robert, John, any, any uh, thoughts on acclimation there? Any tips for these guys? Well, I had a question that I wanted to ask Gary. Yeah. I'm sorry, Robert. No, go ahead. Do you have a rule of thumb for when the product should be taken out of the box or not? That depends upon the, the flooring manufacturer. Um, you get into some products, they will tell you to leave them sealed until they're ready to be installed. Others will tell you to actually open them up. And it really depends upon the floor covering itself. When it comes to acclimation for the floor covering, I always refer basically back to the flooring manufacturer as far as what they're going to require because they know their product. Uh, it's just like you were talking about that, you know, the hospital project with the telegraphing. Some flooring manufacturers say to go through and after you apply your adhesive, to back roll it with a 3 8 inch nap trowel that's dampened with the adhesive just to knock down those trowel ridges. Because like you said, once they come in there and they burnish that, that floor and they put a hot metallic wax on it, every little imperfection is going to telegraph. Thank you. Yep. And uh, Robert, any, any thoughts on acclimation? Any tips you've... <coughs> You picked up over the thing years. I'd probably add to acclimation is, you know, the industry as a whole, you know, we've always knew, you know, wood, wood was the first big one, you know, you've got to acclimate, you got to acclimate. And of course, you know, we've always had acclimation protocols, even for like, like Gary said, for Broadlam. But you know what I like, what I think a lot of guys, because LVT has, of course, taken such great market share in this industry. Yeah. And guys will take this piece of, you know, solid vinyl and they think, oh, well, you know, there's not as much of a need to acclimate. You'd be you'd be amazed how how unstable some of those solid vinyl tiles are, um, and we're getting shrinkage and expansion on those things like crazy. So yes, acclimation is important regardless, and always check with the manufacturer and see what they recommend. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, um, 
The only thing I want to interject is just yeah. what Brother Robert and Brother Gary said. Read the label. In every situation, if yeah. the installer can take the time to read the label, then they're going to protect themselves in their installation as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, and I know also um, every, every manufacturer I'm aware of, I know we do, and, and uh, pretty much any adhesive manufacturer not only is going to have the label, but also their technical data sheet, which will lay out um, in further detail how to install, how to make sure that you've got your substrate prepped, how to make sure that you know all the steps before and after are done correctly. So um, definitely, thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's go ahead and, and uh, talk about some of the installation tools that we get into with these with these different job sites. Then um, I know Gary's got some some tools here in front of him. Um, so Gary, would you mind? Uh, starting us off on tools and and uh, explain some of what you've got here. Okay. Um, well, basically what we've got here, the first two trials, these are both for resilient flooring. First one is just a 1 16th by 1 16th by 1 16th square notch. And what it will do is you've got that square notch, like Robert was talking about earlier. It gives you, basically you're applying a little bit more adhesive than it would be a V notch or a U notch. And what this trial is generally going to be used for with Resilient is over a porous substrate because what we're doing is we're allowing for a portion of the adhesive to absorb into the substrate. The next trial is a 1 16th by 1 32nd by 1 32nd U-notch. You'll see this is a fairly common trial. It's usually designed for installations over non-porous substrates. Could be an existing vinyl floor, a sealed substrate, something like that, or maybe even an underlayment. But by going to that smaller notch trawl, it will actually, you're not having adhesive absorb into the substrate and it'll still give you a reasonable dry time. So Gary, why is it so important? Because I, I know we get hung up on this, right? So why is it so important to know what we've talked about already, to know um, the site conditions and then to choose the right tool? How do those play together? When we test products, we go through and we test a variety of different trawls usually. And you know, a lot of times we may we know exactly what we want and we'll start with that one. But we try to give the optimum performance with the adhesive and the floor covering. So what we're trying to do is give you the best case scenario for performance of your installation. By using the correct trial, that will also give you that performance. Now there's something else should be pointed out. We've got other trials here. These are two V-notch trials. Now these have been used so they're not real pretty but we've got a quarter by quarter sawtooth and then a half inch by 15 30 second sawtooth which is just a massive trowel both of these are designed for installation with hardwood to create a vapor barrier so what that does is it actually will control moisture from coming from the substrate and then damaging or reacting with the hardwood so it's one of these things that you have to make certain that you're using the proper trowel these trials are the only ones that we're, are going to give you that type of moisture protection. If you go to something that may have a flat space between the notches, you're going to have a point where there's a void where moisture could come up and then also damage the floor covering. Right, and I, and I think you just said it, right, the void. So 100% um, coverage, and I know, uh, I know this has been, you know, talked about before as well, but 100% coverage is so important, especially when it comes to moisture uh, protection. And I know with, with our products, um, like our wood products, we have tro uh, trowels, tools, I'm mixing words now. <laughs> we have trowels, making new ones up, that, uh, that are for moisture protection. And then we have other ones that are just for bond only. So what can go wrong uh, if, you, if you grab the wrong tool and, and think you'll just go ahead and install it anyway and get the moisture protection? Uh, that can be a real problem. You know, putting down too much adhesive with wood over a, say, a plywood substrate or a, a slab that's not wet, it's not going to be a problem. You're just wasting adhesive. But if you use an incorrect trowel, you may not actually have your moisture protection. Now, these trowels are actually the trowels that we've adopted for most of our moisture protection adhesives, but it's not just us. Most of our competitors have also adopted these same trowels because what they do is they come to a point between the notches once you displace this, these are all going to be wet set adhesives, you're going to disperse the remaining trowel ridge and it's going to create a vapor barrier. And by doing that, it's going to give you that moisture protection. Now also with these trowels, with some of our adhesives, we'll also give you sound control. So we will provide IIC or STC numbers. IIC is impact isolation class. STC is sound transmission class. So sound transmission class would be for conversations, television, music, things like that, transmitting to the floor below. 
impact isolation is what people are most considered about, con concerned about because of when people are walking across the floor, you hear the Clydesdales upstairs. That's one of those okay, things that will actually give you some reduction. Right now, I got Pardon? a question. You, yeah. you mentioned two things, and I, mm -hmm. and I think it's always good to clarify. It probably should have been back in terminology, but we get a lot of questions. Can you explain to your guys, to the guys listening, the difference where how you classify a moisture barrier versus moisture tolerant? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, Taylor and a lot of the other adhesive manufacturers, most of them actually now, have developed high moisture tolerance adhesives. Uh, they're generally pressure sensitive adhesives or they're designed for resilient floor covering. But what those products will do is they'll handle high moisture. That's just gonna give you bond. It's not gonna protect the floor covering from moisture damage because they're generally gonna be applied with these little square notch trowels like this. So that space between those notches is a point where moisture can permeate up. It's gonna allow it to come up. And those adhesives are really not designed to create a vapor barrier. We don't have perm rates on them or things like that. But what we've done is we'll send products off for third-party testing. We'll verify that it'll handle the moisture and pH ranges that we've actually listed on our, our, our website and also on our TDS and on our pails. But when you're working with a uh, moisture barrier type of product, whether it's for resilient flooring or if it's for hardwood, the trowel dimensions that are specified there are specifically designed to fold into themselves and create that membrane. Now, all of the moisture barrier adhesives that are out there uh, that I'm familiar with are all gonna be wet set unless there's another system that goes below it. Um, so those products are actually designed to be wet set and since they're wet set, you're going into it while the adhesive is wet. And all of the adhesives that are designed for moisture control are all reactive adhesives. That means that they're gonna react from, you put two components together, you got a reaction. If you have a single component product that's moisture, moisture cured, you have a reaction once it's exposed to moisture, and it will actually just fill those voids in and create that membrane that we're looking for to protect that floor covering from moisture damage. So I, I think Robert, to answer that question in a, in a brief statement would be moisture tolerant means it will simply tolerate moisture it's not going to protect you, right? So that's a moisture tolerant adhesive. So you'll see some of those that go up to say even 99. We, we have some that go up to 99% RH. That does not mean it's going to protect the floor covering on top. It simply means it, the adhesive itself, can tolerate the moisture. Then there's a moisture right. barrier adhesive, which we also have those. Those actually do create a moisture barrier, which will protect the flooring above it. So the mm -hmm. big difference no moisture protection for tolerance. It's just tolerant. Moisture barrier gives you that protection. And one question we get a lot is, is this new technology? We've got products that have been out for many years before I even started with Taylor uh, that will handle the moisture. They haven't been changed. Our adhesives haven't really changed in a lot of ways. But what we've done is we've got third party testing. And the reason we're going up to those higher ranges is because the flooring manufacturers are developing resilient flooring products that will also handle those moisture ranges. So John and Robert, I want you guys to jump in. John, um, let, let me get to you first. What other tools besides trowels do you find that are important on, on job sites? Is there anything besides a trowel you'd, uh, you'd wanna talk about? Well, you have spray adhesives. So that's, you're not using a trowel at all there. Sure. Um, the roller is always important. Um, one thing I want to bring up is just for, to share, uh, we always bring this through the apprenticeship program. The trowel is a metering device. So it's gonna control how much adhesive is going to be applied. And so that's to the substrate and you wanna have the proper amount that gets transferred to the back of the product. So that's why it's so important that you have the, the right trowel notch and that you, you make sure you don't leave any puddles or any vacant spots. Um, Absolutely. Rollers are, are also things that are very important to help with the transfer. So, uh, and, and the trowel should not be your final sweep. So vacuum, the final sweep, things like that, you can't, uh, you, you can't overstate that also. So as, as far as broom, vacuum, proper trowel, uh, uh, if you're doing spray adhesive, you know, vacuum even more, and then the proper roller. So uh, yeah, that's that's my answer to that question at least. Yeah, awesome. And then and then not only that, not only the proper trowel, but also holding it at the right angle, right? Because you can get a you can get a lot of variance in coverage depending <laughs> depending on how you hold it. And Ro Robert, do you mind jumping in? I think there's one other thing we wanted to 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 for sure touch on is the importance of knee boards. Um, but before I have you answer that. Um, I do want to remind everyone that they can text their questions in uh, to the number right here. 
Um, Robert, if you want to talk about knee boards, do you use those on job sites? No, I actually use them at the lake behind the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I should, you know, we I should hang out with you I, more, I guess. <laughs> you know, when you Robert, get, you're very hard. That's, that's what I look for for a knee board. You know, we don't, you know, most of my in installation, of course, I was, you know, mostly on the commercial carpet side, obviously, hard surface. We use knee boards a little bit, but I'll be honest with you, I didn't, we didn't use them that much. Um, you know, I will stress just, you know, not only have I been installing for many years, and I don't say that number because it dates me real quick, but, you know, the I also did a lot of troubleshooting for various manufacturers over the years. and. And, and, you know, one thing that we can never stress enough is, you know, I, I'm like uh, John. We, we, don't, we, we don't use meter. We call measuring. But yeah, a trial is nothing more than a measuring device to measure how much adhesive is put on that floor. You know, and what happens is you end up with a trial notch recommended by the manufacturer of the adhesive. So you have a trial notch on the bucket. You get a trial notch size that's recommended by the manufacturer of the product that you're going to install. And yet neither one of those guys really know what your floor condition is, how porous it is, what kind of residue you may have that may be soaking up and pulling more adhesive off your trial. So the guys have to take all of those things into you know the whole equation of what trial they should be using to put down the proper amount of adhesive. So you had mentioned the term transfer. We use the term 100% transfer, meaning if I spread adhesive, let's say I'm doing, I don't care if it's an action back carpet or what have you, and I take that material and I roll it down into that adhesive, and if I were to try to pull it back, I've got what we call 100% coverage. I've got coverage on the material and on the floor. Because the majority of installations that I've looked at over the years, and it's been hundreds of failures for manufacturers over the years, probably the largest issue we find with a Glutarec product is not putting down the proper amount of adhesive. And, and installers need to know, it doesn't matter whether it's a week later, six months later, or 10 years later, when we pull that carpet back, we can see the notches on the floor. We can tell what size notch you use. So it's very easy to kind of determine. The second thing I'm gonna throw in, and I know I'm kind of talking too much, but is using the proper adhesive. You know, I mean, guys are taking double glue applications. You know, they're using from the cushion to the carpet, and they're still using a contract grade, we call them adhesive. Instead of paying the few extra cents for a premium adhesive, that it's gonna keep the elasticity to move on top of that cushion. And that's why we go, in fact, we just went down to a huge, beautiful Axe Country Club and had to replace it because that movement, that contract rate adhesive, it kind of crystallized, broke up. You could just peel all the carpet. It was coming right off the cushion. Yeah. So proper amount yeah, and, we, and proper adhesive. We hate to see that. So speaking of proper adhesive, Robert, thank you because our next segment is actually on product selection. Um, so let's, let's continue that uh, part of the conversation with product selection. So we've already discussed moisture tolerant versus moisture barrier and some of these other things. Um, but let's dive into a little bit of, of some of the other ways that you'd select products. So things like, um, you know, a pressure sensitive, a true PSA versus maybe a transitional pressure sensitive or uh, an adhesive that's wet set or one that does give you a moisture barrier. How, how do you know when to pick which product? John, um, let's start with you. What what do you uh, train in your schools for your guys? How, how do they know which products to select? Well, it's similar to what Brother Robert talked about. You gotta read the label. You wanna use the appropriate product. We feel the manufacturer dictates. So if there is any discrepancy, you wanna follow the guidance of the manufacturer of the flooring product when you're determining uh, which uh, adhesive to use uh, and then as I said earlier I think it's always good to experiment and do a bond test prior to make sure that it works uh, appropriately and the last thing I would bring up and this is something that our contractors have brought up it has to do with the warranty there are differences between the warranties that are supplied by the adhesive manufacturers some adhesive manufacturers say that they'll warrant their product so if you installed 5,000 uh, square yards of a, of a vinyl sheet goods installation and it goes bad, well, they'll, they'll give you the glue to glue it down again. Right. So I, you know, <laughs> how, how much the warranty coverage makes a big difference in who are people want to work with. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. And, and do you feel that that's usually overlooked or is that something that, that most installers would know to look for? I think most installers would not know to look for that. And I think that the ones that do look for it are the ones that learn the hard way that they need to pay attention to that. Hmm. So, so that would definitely be uh, something that everyone watching should take a note of is, is check the product warranty because um, oftentimes it's only as good as, as what it's, it's covering, right? So um, that's a great point. Uh, we, we also have, you know, obviously different types of adhesives, um, you know, moisture cured or reactive adhesives uh, versus waterborne spray adhesives. John, you mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different forms and, uh, and ways to apply um, different chemistries. So Robert, what, what do you teach in, uh, at, down at CFI? How do you teach your guys which um, products they should select? Well, you know, obviously installers are always price sensitive. We try to keep them away from that as best we can. Um, because unfortunately, after talking, you know, with so many distributors over the years, we find that, you know, they're also price driven. What I tell them to do is, you know, when you, when you try to equate the few cents you're going to pay for the difference in those two adhesives, when it comes down to the per yard price cost, it's pennies, it's pennies. Mm -hmm. So we stress to use, you know, premium adhesives and, and, and kind of John, I would agree with John hundred percent. What I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for, okay, what does a manufacturer recommend as far as the type of products? You've got a, a huge selection of manufacturers out there that make some great adhesives. So you want to look at what products you want to use. The second thing I am going to look at, and again, maybe this is from all the years of being in the business and having the issues and non-issues is the warranty. Are they going to back hmm. just their glue? Are they going to back the material? Are they going to back my labor? So yes, I'm going to look at the warranties and then uh, and and make sure that the last thing that they're looking at is the price. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good way to go about it. Is is getting the right product, getting the right warranty, and and price will obviously, you know, come into play at the end of that. So that's that's a good way to look at it versus the reverse, which it sounds like happens more often than not. It really does, and I, I hate to say it, but it really does. And one other thing is adhesive manufacturers put tagets or tracers in their products. We can identify our adhesives, basically. And over the years, I've gone on claims just like Robert, and somebody insists it's our adhesive. Well, when we pull it up, it's not our adhesive. It's another manufacturer's product. And what happens with a lot of the installers, they're buying by price. Whatever that distributor happened to have on sale that month is what they used. And in some cases, they'll go back a year or two later. They don't remember what they used and they have a problem and unfortunately they're basically just left holding the bag because they don't know who to contact or who to go back after and they don't have any verification of the adhesive that they utilized. Hmm. And the only other thing I'd throw out there as well, Seth, is, you know, we, as installers, we become creatures of habit, okay? And, and, and we reach a comfort level. And by that, I mean, we find one bucket of glue, let's say it's a multi-purpose, and, and regardless of what backing and what material, it's that same go-to adhesive. I get it from my distributor. Yeah, send me 10 more buckets of that. And what's happened is the technology. I mean, there's a lot of technology I feel that has went into, especially some of the moisture barrier, moisture tolerant you know, type products. There's a lot of technology that's went into some of the adhesives. So what I'd ask the installers to do is, hey guys, look up. <laughs> look around, you may have a situation that by changing the adhesive you're using, now you have a solution that could have cost you a either a big headache, a job failure, or a lot of money to try to resolve that, or may just be changing it, might be just change your adhesive. Right, so what I'm, what I'm hearing is, oh, go ahead, John. The one thing I wanted to add is the use of the space also. If you're dealing with heavy loads, it, that, the adhesive can have an effect there. If you're dealing, with, how are they going to maintain that floor covering? You know, are they going to over clean it? And so after you do the installation, are you going to have to worry about it being drowned with too much water? So usage of the space and how they're going to maintain it can also play a part in the adhesive that you choose. Yep, absolutely. So absolutely I, critical. I think, uh, I think kind of the take home from all of this in selecting products is all of these areas together then. It's knowing the terminology, knowing what's on the product uh, label, and then also understanding what your job site conditions are, and then 
picking the right installation tools and the right products. Yeah. So if they follow that, and, and like Robert said, don't put price as the number one thing, um, a lot of times they'll end up with the result that they're looking for. So, And stay informed with technology as it changes. We've gotten calls from customers and they've had questions about products that they hadn't seen before, but they may have been out for five or 10 years. And they'll say, well, I wish I would have known about this. This would have saved me on a project last week or last month. And keeping informed makes all the difference yeah. in the world. So do, do your research. Um, so at this point, we're going to take some questions. Um, we're, we're actually a couple minutes late for that, but let's get through some of these. So um, again, if you have questions and you haven't sent them in yet, please text them uh, to the number at the bottom of your screen here. Um, the first question that came in is, I hear, I hear many people, especially in the builder and multifamily markets, say they can't acclimate because of job site conditions. In these cases, how do I avoid problems? Gary. Okay, really what they need to do is, in most cases, they're gonna to need to upgrade the floor covering that they're installing. Unfortunately, when you're installing in a multifamily installation, usually you're using the least expensive LVT and LVP that's out on the market. Uh, you want to you ensure that you have a product that has fiberglass reinforcement in it. If it's fiberglass reinforced, it's going to be more dimensionally stable and it's going to be less likely to move. But that's not possible. Verify with the floor covering manufacturer that that product does not have to be acclimated. If they say the product has to be acclimated, it's not a good choice for that application. Um, another question uh, says, can you discuss solutions for contaminated slabs? Example is going over an adhesive remover. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Sorry, Gary. Okay. Uh, <laughs> adhesive removers are always a problem because concrete by nature is porous. So if you use an abatement chemical or a, an adhesive remover, it's going to, a portion of that's going to absorb into the substrate. And depending upon the density of that concrete, it can penetrate fairly deeply into the concrete. So then as moisture vapor is going to rise and come out of it because concrete's always going to emit moisture, that will bring those chemicals back to the surface. If they will attack cured adhesive, they will attack uncured adhesive and that can be a real problem. Anytime you're removing adhesive, we always re recommend using a mechanical method to do it because it's not going to leave any chemical contamination that could affect the future installation. Okay. Um, we and all I agree. promise. I'll uh, I mean, we get the same situations here. We get the same calls. And we always recommend, I mean, especially now with the machinery, with the discs, with the blades. I mean, there's so much equipment out there now. We, we really try to steer everyone to the mechanical side of a, of a, of a removal. Hmm. It's the best way to go. Yeah. Um, and you're actually going to do less floor prep because you're actually smoothing the slab as you're doing it. Sure. Uh, another question, discuss what type of documentation is necessary for adhesives, um, specifically concerned about warranty issues when using a high moisture adhesive as opposed to a manufacturer recommended adhesive. So <clears throat> um, I, I think the question there is, is what type of documentation is necessary. So um, if you're looking at our products, I guess, and, and I maybe take this one real quick yeah. and, and feel free right to jump ahead. in, Gary. Um, if you're looking at our products as an example, and I can't speak for other manufacturers on this point, but we do have warranties on our website where you can download. So if you're using a high moisture barrier adhesive, um, those do come with a performance warranty. And so you can get that right on our website or our app. Um, as far as other manufacturers, I'd encourage you to do the same. They should have all of that documentation available. So typically we don't require job specific warranties. However, if you want one, uh, Gary and his team are, are always happy to do job specific warranties. Yeah, we're happy to provide them. But one thing I would like to interject on that, or you got something, John? Yes, uh, I think the, um, I, I would like to know what type of documentation does the installer or the employer of the installer need to provide you in order for you to seriously consider the claim? Uh, what we always ask for is we ask for previous moisture testing. Uh, if we require, you know, either we'll give them the option, either calcium chloride or relative humidity, if it appears to be a moisture issue. Uh, it depends upon what, what the, the problem is, but if it's a, a moisture related problem, we always ask for moisture testing. But one thing I would like to really add in here is documentation is critical for you legally. 
Uh, when you do a moisture test on a slab, document everything. Make certain that you put it in the file, into that customer's file. So if you've done calcium chloride tests, you've done relative humidity tests or pH tests, you have documentation of it when it was done. Because if there is a failure four or five years down the line, and you have documentation that you did your due diligence, you moisture tested, you did your pH testing, that will go a long way for you prevailing in a court of law. So you need to be able to defend yourself that you did your moisture testing. If you use just an impedance meter or something like that, at least take a picture of it. At least have something to document it and again, keep it in the file with that customer's information. Great info. All right, guys, we have, we have a lot more questions, so let's be as quick on these answers as we can. And if we don't get your questions answered, um, you can always look at the resources. We'll put a slide up at the end with some uh, additional resources. Um, this question says, do you guys recommend uh, damp mopping the floors? Um, and I'm assuming that means prior to install. And so Gary, really quick. Uh, damp mopping is always a good idea. Like uh, John said, we don't, you don't want your trial to be your final sweep. It's a good way to get any remaining particulate that you missed with the vacuum. Okay. Um, another question, could you go over the importance of rolling the floor? That's, uh, that's an easy one. Uh, any type of glue down installation, whether it's carpet or resilient, requires rolling because you want to be able to embed that floor covering into the adhesive while it is still viable. If you come back a day or two later, the adhesive may not be tacky and it may not work. Yep. And Robert, I saw you uh, had something on rolling. No, just the same thing. It, it's, it's all to get that transfer. It's got, you got to get the transfer of the adhesive into the back of the material, regardless of what it is. Yep. Um, how important is it to follow ASTM 710 and flatness using adhesives and proper trowel sizes? Uh, that's absolutely critical for resilient floor covering. Uh, okay. That's really where it's most critical because if you're if you don't follow those you know those regulations or you know that their, their protocols, modular products the joints may not line up, and if you're even doing sheet goods, you're going to actually get telegraphing of any imperfections from that substrate. So preparing that substrate is critical. Yeah. Um. And then uh, this question said, there's lots of growth in floating floors today. When should I use a glue down versus, of, versus floating? Or when, when to know when to do which, I guess. Um, I always I push for glue down. <laughs> I, think, I think site conditions, right? <laughs> Some of that's gonna be site conditions, application. Like John said earlier, when, uh, you know, what, what is it gonna be used for? Um, things like that. Yeah, generally um, I consider a floating floor for residential and for a, as a temporary floor. A glue down is going to be permanent or for heavy traffic. Okay, another question. Um, so uh, this one says, wondering if choosing the correct primer should be discussed with regards to sealing prior to the adhesive. So I think the question here will be, how important is, is priming um, to seal maybe, I, I'm guessing like a porous substrate like a gypcrete or something prior to adhesive use? Do you guys want that or you want me to? Well, for, for gypcrete, lightweight concrete, priming is absolutely critical. Uh, the gypcrete manufacturers say that their products have to be primed or sealed before you install a glue down application because what will happen is you'll get overabsorption of the adhesive. In a lot of cases, those slabs are dusty also and it'll combine the dust so you don't have that dusty surface. Okay. Um, another question, is there a weight limit on your glues? Hospital beds can make wheel marks if, if the glue is too soft or elastic. Uh, yeah. Basically, what we do is we follow the Hill Realm, you know, regu regulations on it. Uh, it's a weighted caster that I forget the the number of re revolutions that it does. We actually do in-house testing. So what you're trying to do is what we're looking for with adhesive is disbursement of that adhesive. So once the adhesive is cured, is it going to displace or indent? Uh, the floor cover can also indent. So we don't really put a weight limit per se. It's just going to be a typical hospital bed with a patient in it. Sure. And we do, uh, on all of our, again, read the label, read the documentation, right? We do specify which products can handle heavy rolling loads. And we do also document out what to do, how long to give it um, before you uh, put heavy rolling loads on it. Um, and then uh, another question real quick. Do you recommend blocking off sunlight during the open time? Robert, you want to take that? Depending on how bad the sunlight is. You know, if I'm right up against a window, a sliding glass door, although we're talking that's on a residential application, um, I mean, sometimes it's inevitable. I mean, you go into office buildings, you got windows, most of them are tinted. Uh, if it's not that strong, we don't worry too much about it. 
And one thing you should add on there, some of the flooring manufacturers, a couple of them, require that the windows are covered during acclimation, installation, and then cure time of the adhesive for some resilient flooring products. So they're usually real thick gauge, you know, like uh, gym floor, floor covering type products. That's where I ran into that. So okay, just something, follow the instructions again. Got one last question and then we're gonna be done because we're running out of time. So um, at concrete admixtures, uh, how do do those have an effect i guess so that's a that's a tricky one um yeah admixtures are one of those kind of gray areas there are some really good ones and there's some that are questionable um generally the ones i have a question about are the silicates because what they can do is they can leave a silicate residue on the surface which creates a bond breaker so that becomes an issue uh, doing bond testing like john mentioned earlier that is always a good step because it'll tell you what's going on but you also have to look at the protocols that the admixture manufacturer puts in place what they require what what needs to be done to that substrate before the installation goes on because it can vary from admixture man manufacturer to manufacturer yep um, thank you for your questions. For those that we didn't get to today, we will we will get to those. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for joining us again today. John, thank yep. you as well. Really appreciate uh, having you guys here as part of the discussion. Please remember, um, you can like us and follow us, connect with us on social media. You can download our app, um, check out our website. We have a newsletter that goes out every month. We do these events once a month, so we will be live December 15 at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, with our with our next episode. So be sure and, and uh, catch us for that. Um, I, I think that's all the time we've got for today. So thank you guys so much for being here. And just remember, we're Taylor Adhesives, and we are with you every step. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, Robert. You guys were phenomenal.